Welcome to Feminist Buzz Kills, the show that Kylie Jenner and Timothy Chalamet were whispering about at the Golden Globes. And while Liz is away on assignment, I'm joined by my co-host, Alyssa Alduki. Hey, Moji. I love that there are two top listeners of the podcast. It's really good for us. I'm super pumped to be guest hosting this pod with you because this episode has a little bit of everything. Today, we're talking about how touting abortion ban exceptions as a humane and reasonable compromise is total bullshit, but taking them away in total is inhumane. That it is. And our guests to help us out are Pamela Merritt, Executive Director of Medical Students for Choice, and Lauren Miller, a Texas woman who needed abortion care and is currently suing the state to get some clarity about how these exceptions work. We'll also be joined by the hilarious Emma Willman to talk about comedy, gender, and everything she's doing to be a little less chaotic. Mmm, chaotic. That sounds like New Year to me. Happy New Year, Alyssa. Happy New Year. What's your New Year looking like, Moji? Oh, you know, I got I got really sick on January 1st, so I started the year super strong by spending a week in bed, and that was... A thing. I survived. <laughs> it's kind of goals, but also not in that way. Definitely not goals. What about you? My Christmas decorations are still up. So I'm actually I'm actually still in 2023. I'm still doing that. I'm not, I haven't moved on yet. Nice. For the first time ever, being a person who was raised in New York, I went to Times Square for the ball drop. I went with six kids and five adults, and it was about as harrowing as it sounds, but it was also super fun. <laughs> I will never be doing that again, just so we're clear. <laughs> yeah, I. what I'm gathering is that we. I think we both needed a bit of a New Year's do-over. I think, what do you say, we just do Lunar New Year and give ourselves another month to get our shit together? I like it. I like it. I think that's the time I need to really lean into what year is this again? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll figure it out by, by February 10th. That'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, what's that sound? Do you hear it? I think it's time for Johnson Watch. <laughs> this is the segment where we continue to deep dive into the icky history of our creepy current Speaker of the House. And listen, Dukes, this story is plenty icky. It really is. So in line with being overly involved in his children's budding sexuality, in 2015, Mike Johnson squired his then 13-year-old daughter to a purity ball. Ew. And at that purity ball, she signed her sexuality over to him and he gave her a ring while she was in a white dress. Does that, does that sound like something that parents shouldn't do with their children? That sounds real bad. It sounds real bad. And you know what what's even more bad is they've got they've got footage. Ew. I know. Ew. It's someone recorded this for all of history, but this footage has mysteriously disappeared from the internet. And where the internet is forever, unless you're the speaker of the house, apparently. Oh my god, you totally are sounding like Jeff Goldblum here. It's really funny. <laughs> That is what I'm channeling right now. We talked about this in a previous episode. He was sharing porn accountability with his son. So this is his thing. Ew. And the other part I like of this is they have their own like words around this. It's not that he, it's not that he's in charge of his children's sexuality. It's not that he's owning anyone's sexuality. It's called headship. That sounds gross too. <laughs> I think basically they were like, well, we don't want to call it being in charge we just want to make a new word mm. and say it's a totally different thing but we're not in charge we're just in headship we're just head shipping we're just head shipping what's also kind of gross about this and i know he's not the only person who's taken a child to a purity ball but it's wild to me that there's like it really does like put a finer point on the transfer of ownership that they like hold their children under specifically their daughters let's be honest just, i don't know about the boy uh the boy purity ball. Yeah, do boy do boys have purity balls? I think they just have covenant eyes. Covenant eyes. <laughs> <laughs> just an app to track to track your sons, but we have to have a whole fet for the gals. Gross. I just want to remind everyone that like this man is seriously policing his children's genitals and he is second in line to the presidency <laughs> and writing legislation. So we need to be very afraid. Let's get the show started, shall we? While I may have broken free from the bathroom, Molly's here to drop a steaming pile of this <laughs> week's news on you. Welcome back, Molly. Thank you, friends, and welcome to your first steaming news dump of 2024. And if these stories are any indicator of what this year is going to be like, it's going to be very shitty and very bleak. 
The first story is truly horrific and enraging. We had some very tragic news out of Texas this week. We are just learning that Yenny Glick, a 29-year-old woman from the town of Luling, died in July 2022 from the vast ecosystem of neglect that these abortion bans create. Yenny had multiple health conditions that made pregnancy very dangerous, but no one told her that and no one told her abortion could save her life. Why? The only hospital she could access was Catholic, who turned her away because they don't even speak of abortion. And in Texas, a state that has made getting an abortion nearly impossible. Can you guys believe that our next story also has to do with a pregnant woman of color who was turned away from a Catholic hospital? You may remember Brittany Watts of Ohio, right? The woman who was charged with abuse of a corpse for having a miscarriage in her own home after the hospital refused to give her abortion care. Remember it. Mm -hmm. The one where a nurse called the police on her when she came back to get treatment for said miscarriage? This week, a grand jury has declined to indict her, uh, which is good news, but, you know, not before Ohio could gaslight, torture, and traumatize this person for just trying to live. I'm really sorry, you guys. I'm living up to the buzzkill's name today because the world (laughs) is trash. (laughs) Uh, it is bleak and shitty, but, you know, we have each other. This last story is lighter, but still needs a full-bodied roast, okay? A pro-life coffee company called Seven Weeks has raised over $300,000 for fake clinics. Fuck that shit! Oh, God. Oh, no. It's so much money! Where's our pro-abortion coffee? Think of all the possibilities, you know? The morning after blend. Tasters <laughs> pro-choice. Or my favorite, Tim Abortance. <laughs> Let's get this going, people. Call us. That has been your steaming news dump. Back to you guys. Yeah, we're going to get to those states, but uh, pro-life coffee? Why seven weeks? Is that the reasonable compromise? Uh, that's very funny. I looked it up on their website. They call it seven weeks because they say a coffee bean is the size of a seven-week fetus, which I find hilarious because they're just going home and grinding the shit out of all these beans. So every bean matters. Uh, they're not very pro bean. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Thank you. Now let's get to the meat of this podcast. This week we have a story so big it needed two guests. Dukes, set us up. When the fate of abortion went back to the states after the fall of Roe v. Wade, forced birth, fascists, and government did literally everything they could to make sure no one in their states could ever get an abortion. And last week, Texas and Idaho took huge steps to make that a reality by eliminating exceptions for emergencies. So much for being pro-life. And that brings us to EMTALA. EMTALA is the acronym for the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which was passed to guarantee emergency medical care for anyone, regardless of their ability to pay. But lately, you've probably heard about it more often in the context of reproductive justice. But before we get into this hellscape, Moji, can you break down the timeline of how we got to this point? Absolutely. So right. June 2022, Dobbs decision. Abortion bans in many places, including Texas and Idaho, go into effect. The minute this happens, the federal government issues guidance that Imtala still stands. But Texas's attorney general, Ken Paxton, fights that guidance and wins. And to repeat, Imtala is basically saying when a person comes up in an emergency situation, we got to stabilize them. And he's like, oh, hell no. Yeah, he's a winner. And this exact thing led in March 2023 A group of Texas women who have been harmed by these abortion bans banded together to talk about the harm and ask the courts for guidance around these exceptions. This led to moving and terrifying testimonies in July that you may remember in the news. One woman threw up on the stand while testifying, and the Texas AG argued that these women standing before them had no standing because they were no longer pregnant. Also in March 2023, the Idaho abortion ban makes doctors so fearful that the state closes a maternity ward in the region, leaving pregnant people in that area 46 miles away from any sort of OBGYN care. And in Tennessee, back in September, Tennessee women who suffered while miscarrying also banded together to file a suit asking for clarity around these exceptions that were not getting them the health care they needed, like they want you to believe that these exceptions will. To just go back to Texas for a minute, you may remember just last month in December, Kate Cox, a woman who was pregnant with a non-viable fetus, finally managed to get a judicial exception for a therapeutic abortion because she was pregnant. And the Texas was like, I guess you can talk to us about it. And she gets the exception and the Fifth Circuit immediately reverses that decision and she has to leave the state for care. 
And that brings us back to the story of Yenny Glick that Molly just told us about in the steaming dumped, who would have lived had she received an abortion, but no one even told her that. So this brings us to exactly what's happening in this minute, right? All these people have had, have suffered. All these people have had, are just saying, they're not even trying to reverse the bans. They're just saying, we would like some clarity. We would like doctors to be able to tell us what these exceptions mean. And the Fifth Circuit of Appeals just said, oh, the uh, exceptions that we have are fully clear. And it's clear. You have to be literally dying to receive abortion care. Yeah. Texas was like, oh, uh, you dozens now of women who are suing the state because the exceptions aren't clear. I have a great idea. Get rid of the exceptions. Is that clear enough for you? Is basically how this feels to me. And that brings us over to Idaho as well, where SCOTUS says it's okay for Idaho to continue with their ban and to not adhere to Mtala until SCOTUS has a chance to review the case. And that, inshallah, is in April. Inshallah. Inshallah with the eye roll. (laughs) This has been an extremely confusing time to be a healthcare provider. And our next guest is here to give us an inside look at the effects of these bans. Joining us is the Executive Director of Medical Students for Choice, a global nonprofit working to ensure medical students are trained in family planning and abortion care. Please welcome Pamela Merritt. Hi, Pamela. Hello. Hey, welcome. Glad to be here. And we're so excited to have you. It's always a pleasure. We just set up what Imtala means and the recent rulings affecting Texas and Idaho. Can you explain how Imtala affects doctors and how it's supposed to work? Oh, great question. Um, So I'll start with how it's supposed to work. You know, the United States has an extremely flawed and um, and expensive and ineffective healthcare system. But Imtala is one of those things that actually was supposed to alleviate the burden of just dying in the middle of the street because you know that the hospital wouldn't accept you. So it really quite literally is just if you are in crisis, you go to the hospital, you do not get turned away, whether you don't have insurance, whether you're on Medicaid, Medicare, and also if you're not a citizen of this country, if you're visiting from Taiwan, you can still, you know, go to the hospital for emergency care and they are required by federal law to see you and to treat you. So that that's how it's supposed to work. And then Idaho never shies away from an opportunity to, you know, shock and dismay the masses. So Idaho yeah. decided Um, We don't like the idea of people not dying in the middle of the street, and we want to be able to create this horrible circumstance for people who are pregnant. But honestly, it does extend beyond that. People who break their leg in a farming accident, that it's a broad challenge to the law because, you know, law is typically Broad. And even though they're motivated on this one issue, the Supreme Court is considering the whole darn thing, if I read it right. What it means for doctors is that doctors are really answering to the administration of their hospital. So the worst outcome for doctors is that hospitals will be forced to do things that are ethically questionable, if not unethical on its surface, and that they will experience the moral distress of knowing that they can save somebody's life and not being able to do it. Knowing you can save somebody's life, having the training and the expertise to do it, and being told because of politics and just quite honestly mean-spirited, evil politicians, that you're not able to do that. And I don't have a single member of Medical Students for Choice In all 30 countries, we have chapters and every single member wants to do no harm and save lives. Wow, that's incredible. So you read it like it's not just abortion. It's all the ways people get helped and stabilized. Let's keep it real. I mean, that's the way, you know, when I look at how people have stretched the meaning of Supreme Court rulings on voting and on everything else, the Supreme Court doesn't decide whether Idaho can turn away people who are pregnant from receiving abortion care. They are, the sole purpose of the Supreme Court is to decide the law of the land. Big umbrella law, (laughs) like row or no row. So I find it laughable that folks are thinking it would just be this one narrow interpretation. To me, it opens up the door for conservatives to challenge whether or not hospitals are required to treat you if you do not have money Um, and how far are hospitals supposed to go, which I'm old enough, sort of, I don't remember when um, 
and Tala came down. But I do remember as a young person in, you know, Ronald Reagan's America, people Mm -hmm people were turned away from certain hospitals. And I can't, I don't know if it's because of that, but if you had, if you did not have Medicaid or Medicare and you did not have insurance, you know, people were walked out the door. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't come down until 1986. Okay. So I'm right. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. exactly. You did such a great job answering the question about how it's going to impact doctors. And what you're saying is it doesn't only impact those patients going in there for reproductive health, but pretty much anybody. So in a state like Idaho, where 50% of the OBGYNs are being forced to leave, you know, Mm -hmm. and there are huge segments of the state that have almost no maternal care, let alone abortion care, like how different is an abortion ban with exceptions versus a total ban with no doctors and some exceptions? Ah, that's a great question. Exceptions are a lie. So um, they don't apply. They don't work. So the easy answer there is that there aren't a lot of differences. And particularly when you get down to the business of medicine and hospitals and their lawyers, um, their legal and ethical board, which I think a lot of people just woke up to the, you know, the existence of after the fall of Roe. But the way hospital systems work is that they are incredibly risk averse. ob is one of the most expensive areas for a hospital to have because of its high insurance rates and its likelihood of lawsuit. It's not inaccurate to say that most of this is probably going to be about, you know, the abortion law. But the reality is that exceptions are so poorly defined and are so narrow that, you know, very few hospital, you know, legal boards are going to say, okay, we're willing to take that risk. And Mm -hmm. there's a reason for that, which is that, you know, they're interested in providing public health to an entire community. And if I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, shutting down a hospital and, and, you know, over one patient's needed care um, is a great movie plot, but it is not necessarily the best public health move. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Texas and you look at Idaho, Texas is already calling questions. Idaho is now pursuing in the courts. So Texas had that whole, you know, can we provide care? Can we do emergency care? You know, doctors are like, I have no idea what the hell I can and can't do and are publicly saying that. So when you look at the confusion in Texas and the the fact that the pregnant people who are suing in that state have really forced a discussion of how really crappy, poorly written law that is supposed to govern, you know, medical practice, the two are literally like two different languages. And so they're going to err on the side of we're not going to get sued and shut down entirely. And that's why doctors in Texas are basically saying these exceptions do not actually exist. I mean, we could even say that they don't exist. I and mean, we saw in, in sort of the cases that are happening in Texas, just to stay in mm-hmm. Texas for a minute, mm-hmm. right? They're the women and the people who are formerly pregnant who are harmed. And mm-hmm. one of the one of the arguments was like, oh, they don't have standing because they're not pregnant yeah. any longer. And then yeah. we had in December, Katie Cox, who was pregnant and mm-hmm. gone. And then they the Fifth Circuit also said, no, 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 that's also not. Yeah. I think that was one of the moments where it was really laid bare mm-hmm. how the exceptions don't work and they're designed not to work. I think that's what yes. the showing cards part that I think we've been, we're seeing now. Absolutely. You know, basically exceptions are window dressing for a tuned out and not connected electorate. And then they, you know, I know that since Roe fell and the bans have all hit, they've been walking around like anti-abortion politicians and bad actors have been walking around saying, well, the doctors are reading this wrong. Doctors don't go to med school to witness preventable death. And doctors don't go to become OB-GYNs as a specialty to witness preventable maternal death. I, I've yet to meet one that is not, they're not on some sort of macabre, you know. It's not a cake that exists. No. <laughs> Unlike the legislators. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So like the idea that they're going to sit there and look for ways to not do their job is ridiculous. They, the lawyers often step in and hinder that in the long, short-term and long-term consequences of that you can see now in Idaho. So I know you're not a lawyer. You are a person that works with doctors. <laughs> How bad 
do you think it's got to get before we see some change? I think it's going to get horrific. And I think I'm reminded of the the documentary film that HBO had on the James and how right after Roe was decided that they closed down their sepsis, you know, ward and that they had an entire ward dedicated to people who were dying um, of infections in their blood from, you know, botched abortion. I think of that often when I think about how bad it can get. Here's why. I say it's going to get a lot worse, which is that what we're seeing across the country are pro-abortion efforts to pass, you know, some sort of codification of Roe at the ballot. And so the ballot measures, which I tend to be the Debbie Downer in the room about because, you know, they come with with flaws. Mm -hmm. The ballot measures, even in the best case scenario, are opening up the door for abortion with bans, with restrictive language that basically narrows the scope of who can access care. So in Michigan, where they passed this awesome ballot measure, then you got, you know, this amazing democratic trifecta that was going to pass the Reproductive Health Act, which they still were not able to get at all the trap. So the ballot didn't take out the trap laws. The RHA that they passed didn't take out the trap laws. That to me is a good example of how complicated policy is and how hard it is to decon like dismantle really crappy policy. So when I think about what's going to be happening in banned states that do advance ballots, is that you're you have an electorate, a population that thinks everything's good. And then you have the reality that for the people most impacted by reproductive health restrictions and regulations, those people are still screwed. So what we're going to see is kind of just to go back to Ronnie Reagan's America. I grew up in the 1980s watching poor people become a toy, like a football, political football for um, conservatives. And I think what that looks like when I when I think about reproductive health care is horrific, but you're going to have people who need an abortion later in pregnancy, and they're not going to be able to get it because the ballot measure allowed for 60 percent of the people who need an abortion to get one, but it, it had viability in it. Right. So it didn't, mm-hmm. it didn't go for those people. So all of the horrific scenarios we're we're reading and trying to organize to prevent are not going to be taken care of by ballot measures. And and we don't, to my knowledge, I'm not seeing anybody articulate a national strategy to advance reproductive justice and, and liberate abortion from this entire legislative process. People aren't thinking about what is possible. They're thinking about the narrow thing of what can I, what do I think I can get through rather than what we need. Right. And so as long as activists and organizations are proactively compromising on abortion, there will be incredible, horrific stories of vulnerable people who were left behind. And it and it gives me no joy to say that, but that's kind of where we are. I, I think it's already probably worse than what we know, and mm-hmm. it's going to get worse. That's what I think a lot, that it's, you know, we're hearing, we're now hearing these blockbuster stories a year, two years out mm-hmm. from the fall of mm-hmm. Roe, but I'm like, there are all these, this is what we're hearing is the tip of the iceberg, right? There are all these other people who are... yeah under-resourced, who stories we're not hearing. We're mostly only hearing the stories of some kind of privileged white women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The folks who can, um, who can, you know, sit down with a reporter and ask the question. I, I keep thinking about, you know, my organizing work, which was in St. Louis, Missouri, which is a, a city that should be a state, a city <laughs> that has, uh, you know, a lot of economic challenges. It, it has a lot of Black women who are head of household, who are working service jobs or fast food jobs, who, you know, are already having horrible pregnancy outcomes because they have to return back to work within a week or two weeks of giving birth. And I think about those folks 
and how the press, unless my city wants to, you know, burn itself down, they're not interested in economically challenged areas. They're also, the same thing goes for rural parts of states. They don't care that, um, you know, rural Missouri and most rural parts of states don't have access to pregnancy care at all, that they're having to drive, you know, there's no maternal care at their hospital. And what they're getting is subpar. Most people don't realize that med schools aren't required to teach about family planning and abortion care. You know, that emergency room doctors might not know how to perform abortion in a high risk sex case. That's a fact. And, you know, emergency room doctors immediately after Roe fell, they were like, oh, wait, we need to learn how to do this because we're going to see more, more catastrophic pregnancy outcomes. But yeah, I, I think there's just a, there's a branding of American healthcare that the reality hasn't lived up to in my lifetime. So I think folks just really are are about to get another wave of wake up calls, basically. You kind of touched on it in that last answer, but I'm curious, you know, as you, with your work with med students, like how are the students having to respond? How are the educators having to respond? And what are med students saying about how this is impacting their education? So medical students kind of said what they said when we were looking at last year's match in March, which is when medical students graduate and then they um, go through this really anxiety striking interview process with residency programs, um, which are where they get to specialize, but it's really residencies where they, they get hands-on, they learn how to doctor, doctor, mm -hmm. doctor. So at the match, we saw a 10% decline of medical students even trying to match in abortion ban states. And that's not wow. just medical students who are interested in obstetrics and gynecology. That's medical students because their medical students are also people and they don't want to be pregnant in a state where they're going to have to, you know, jump across the state line if there's an issue. And most of them are looking at it as, you know, an environment, do I want to spend six years there or eight years there? Do I want to begin a practice there? That was just March of last year. Now that we're seeing the federal court system fail to uphold the rule of law and, and everything's being channeled to a Supreme Court that doesn't validate, you know, stare decisis, um, you know, any precedent anymore. Now that you're seeing that, Med students are really looking at it in terms of, I've taken about half a million dollars in debt. I've sacrificed for my pre-med, four years of pre-med in college, four years of med school. And I, I'm competitive because my members are competitive like I've never seen before. They want to get the best education. They want to know the best techniques to help their patients. So what they're seeing it as is, should I go to a state where they won't even say the word abortion and they're basically giving me some song and dance about how they're going to get me in clinic training, even though we're five states away from that opportunity. Or should I go to a residency program in a state where I can actually learn all of the things that are modern and are associated with modern medicine? And then once these idiots fix these laws, I'll go back to Alabama or I'll go back to Tennessee. And this is all happening in a country with the worst pregnancy outcomes in the developed world. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like we were we were hitting home runs before, but I can't look at my membership and say you're going to you need to make some sort of grand sacrifice of your entire career for something that nobody can even give you a time frame of when they're going to fix it. Yeah. Pamela, it is always so fascinating to talk to you and so great. You have such insight and you, you know, so much. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking about this really heavy topic. Yeah. Thanks for breaking it all down for us. Thank you both for what you do. Um, I love the podcast. I think it is such a critical vehicle for information and for keeping it real. So thank you for the opportunity to be on. You can follow Pamela Merritt on the social media site, formerly known as Twitter, at SharkFoo. She also wants you to know that Med Students for Choice and American Medical Student Association have a petition asking for abortion training to be included in the accreditation requirements of each medical school. The link to sign it is in our show notes.
Pamela is such a treat to talk to, and she so brilliantly broke down what's going on and how it continues to affect doctors. Our next guest has a personal experience to share. Yes, even before the zero exceptions ruling, Texas did not have an exception for lethal fetal abnormalities, and that is what led our next guest to join the class action lawsuit against the state of Texas. Please welcome Lauren Miller. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lauren. Hi, thanks for having me. Lauren, you've been in the news telling the story of your pregnancy and how it was affected by Texas laws. For those who might not know, could you tell us briefly what happened and how did we get to this point? Yeah, my pregnancy was really a story that shows how the state of Texas does not care about our lives and really the any care for the quote unquote unborn is just a farce as well. Cause I was pregnant with twins and in September, 2022. So just a few months after Roe fell, I found out that one of my twins was not viable. He tragically had half of his brain was fluid. He had a variety of other abnormalities and he had trisomy 18 And I was very sick. I'd already been hospitalized once with hyperemesis gravidarum. So very severe morning sickness, like to the point that I thought I was going to throw up my organs, like throw up so violently that the placenta would detach and I'd lose them all. And so I was very sick and they couldn't do anything. All any doctors, nurses, genetic counselors could say was that every day that I continued with this unviable twin and my healthy twin, that my unviable twin put my health and the life and health of his twin brother at risk. And so my husband and I had to, as quickly as we could, we had to go out of state to Colorado so I could get an abortion. And in March of last year, of 2023, I delivered a healthy, the healthy twin, Henry. And so he's about nine months old now, very healthy. But if I hadn't been able to go out of state, he wouldn't be here. He would be with his brother in an urn on a shelf in my office. Your story is harrowing. You actually kept a diary um, of what was happening. And when I read it, I had to just like take a moment and take a deep breath, like so much. It's it's not even a question. I just want to say like, I'm so sorry you had to go through all of that. And I'm so excited that you have a healthy Henry. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Yeah. The diary was (laughs) such a, you know, it's such a strange thing to look back on because I started it to one day be able to show my kids like, Hey, pregnancy is rough. Like don't put somebody in this situation. Don't end up in this situation. You don't have to go through this unless it's something you actually want to. And I never thought that my pregnancy journal would just turn into this horror novel. It is. So I want to go back to one of the things, but my actual question, one of the things you said early on, you said that your doctors were not telling you things. So there's no actual law in Texas about doctors talking about abortion or suggesting a person go out of state. But you say your doctor seemed especially cautious about letting you know your options. I had a child and I I have one child and it was, I remember I was talking all the time. I had questions about everything. What was that experience like? It felt like the state was in the office with you. Like it felt like Ken Paxton might as well have been just, you know, feet up on the desk, uh, you know, chewing on a pen cap beside us as we were going through these visits. And you could just feel this fear because when we were going through this process, it was pretty soon after the Dobbs decision, after Roe fell. So people still didn't really know how to go about things. And so you would you would have like a, a genetic counselor. So I mean, I remember her, you know, her job's not even to provide abortions. It's just to counsel on options. And I remember she mentioned a single fetal reduction, which is an abortion of one twin. It's what I needed. And then just clammed up, you know, it's, you could just feel that fear of her thinking like, oh my God, did I say too much? Am I going to get, you know, is she going to go report on me? Am I going to get hunted by this bounty law now? And it was it was horrible to go through this. They were apologizing to us for not being able to say more because you would have these various medical professionals getting halfway through a sentence and then just stopping, scared to even say the word abortion out loud. And they start apologizing to us for not being able to say more as we're apologizing for just asking questions because we know what they're going through. We don't want to put them in this difficult situation. And here, here they are, here we were. And so it's, It's horrible all around, too. It's literally a state inserting themselves into your doctor appointment. That's so terrifying. It's surreal. 
it just should not be controversial to be able to have an open conversation with your doctor, with your medical team. And yet there they are. They are right there. They're involved in it. And you just should not have politics and the legal process involved in healthcare. And you already had a child. So you knew what medical care was supposed to be like. Yes. Uh, So I was comparing everything to what we'd gone through with our first. So I was probably coming into this more informed because pregnancy is one of those things where a lot of it, you don't know until you're going through it. I think there's a lot of things they never tell us because they're like, honey, if you don't know, you might actually have a kid. If you know, you're not going to go through that. And so I feel like I was probably coming into that more informed than a lot of people too. And even still, it was just, you could just feel it in the room. Yeah, that was something I was thinking about as you told your story is how many gaps you had to fill of information and how are people who don't have that information yet or don't have the resources to get that information dealing with that. And you are part of this lawsuit and, you know, every pregnancy is different and that's not what these laws acknowledge. But what is similar in the experiences that the others in the lawsuit about how you've been treated by the state of Texas throughout your pregnancies as different as they may be. So I want to first address kind of the first part of your question. And that was the having the knowledge. And I very much recognize like I had pretty much every resource you could have. I was the best case scenario and it was still difficult. It was still hard to get answers. It was still hard to find information. It was traumatic. It was terrifying. And that was with everything at my disposal. I I know doctors out of state, so I could be, you know, I could be texting with a doctor in Colorado. We had the funds to be able to travel. We had the childcare. We're geographically, I'm just a mile from the maternal fetal medicine specialist to be able to quickly get in for an appointment as needed. So even with all of that, it was still difficult. And something I said, you know, when we first filed this, and you're seeing it even more and more now, is that layers of privilege determine who has access to healthcare in Texas. And increasingly, it's not just determining who has access to healthcare, it's determining if we live or die. And that's a a huge part of the tragedy, the situation. And so for those of us in the lawsuit, if we've been able to go out of state or not, uh, some of us were able to go out of state for an abortion, some had to stay in state. I mean, that's these are the kind of things that are all factoring in. You also asked about, you know, how the state has treated us. It was jarring at how little they knew or cared about us, both in the hearing last July and at the Supreme Court hearing in November. I remember the Beth Klusman, who was representing the state, was asked about anencephaly, and she just kind of giggled and waved it off of didn't know what that meant. And yet that's something that it impacted several of my co-plaintiffs. For one of the others, she was pregnant with twins and would, and one of her twins had anencephaly. So her daughter may not be here. She hadn't been able to get an abortion. And it was this like little kind of like Dolores Umbridge, like, I don't know, anencephaly, just so dismissive. Which is, if I remember properly, a lack of brain in a fetus. No skull. There is no skull. You can't live with that. That is not viable. And she just kind of didn't know, didn't care. Uh, She was also talking about how we should sue our doctors. My doctor was right there in the courtroom with me. Like, why would I sue her? She was trying to help me. And it was just unbelievable how little she knew about our cases. I would, you know, if I was one of the justices, I would have been insulted that there was that little preparation from them because it meant that they thought that it was just a slam dunk that they would win. So as a justice, I'd be insulted by that as a plaintiff and somebody whose life and whose child's life was, you know, jeopardized by these bans. It was just an insult. So they were literally so concerned with the fetus. They had no concern for the people who were impacted, (laughs) the people who had to go to court. None. And they're not even that concerned with the fetus because in my case, I had twins. So there was one fetus that was not viable. Again, like half of his brain was fluid. He was not going to live. You can't live like that. Mm -hmm. And so there was no question of viability for him. The other fetus is my now healthy son and they didn't care. So this is where it, you know, it all falls apart when they're talking about protecting unborn life because they flat out didn't. So you went through all of this and you're still going through it because as I recall, your case is still ongoing, right? There's no, there hasn't been a resolution. 
Correct. It's still ongoing. So we're still waiting to hear from the Texas Supreme Court. You've kind of gone from mom and pregnant woman to, along with all your other hats, an unlikely advocate, right? How are you balancing stepping into this new role as an unlikely advocate? Three years ago, I'm sure you didn't have this on your plate and speaking for and also with the women you know, and also like having a life and being a new parent. Your child's nine months old. So I'll be honest, I've been pretty politically involved for a long time, you know, block walking, all of that. Uh, I'm one of those annoying people who's been sending you text messages on your cell phone. There are real people behind those a lot of the times. So for me, I had always expected to continue to stay involved in various things beyond just, you know, rage Instagramming at midnight or three in the morning as I'm dealing with a newborn. But I didn't ever expect to, you know, see my big pregnant belly splashed across everything from the New York Times to the BBC because we were filing a lawsuit against Texas over the bans. So that's been a little surreal. Uh, instead of just going through a normal postpartum period, it's reading legal documents about our case and trying to make sure that when I could travel in July that, you know, how was I going to handle nursing for the day? Cause I still had a baby and it's a very surreal place to be. And also going from, you know, just like normal day job to then filming with Diane Sawyer to talk about my abortion. Very surreal place to be. It seems pretty surreal. Yeah. Especially because when that aired, it was like, I was dealing with my toddler had just like shoved a blanket in the toilet and I was like, okay, this is my real life. Uh, <laughs> What you've been through has been something that no one should ever have to deal with. And hopefully because of the action that you and the other plaintiffs are taking in the future, people will also not have to deal with this. What do you wish for Texans and what do you want Texans and people in other states with similar bans to know? So first, I think that in looking at this case, there's there's something of a victory already is that people are looking at us and realizing why later term abortions are needed. And I say late, I mean, 15 weeks is still very early when I got mine, but people are actually looking it up. They're realizing, oh, you can't go in for amniocentesis until 20 weeks. You can't learn some of this stuff until later. When people are going through, you know, a 23 week, 25 week abortion, it's because they've gotten devastating news. And so I think folks are starting to wake up. I think they also, you know, you talked about how my doctors and my medical team were scared to talk. I think folks are realizing that as we've learned more, they can at least talk with patients, even if that was so unclear at the time that I was going through it. And with Texans and with people in general, you know, one in four get an abortion. So statistically, what that means is that for anyone who thinks they don't know anyone who's had an abortion, it just means they don't know anybody who's told them and who's trusted them with that information, or they just don't know somebody yet. Like that is coming. These laws are going to impact everyone. So even if you don't ever want or expect to need an abortion, if you, you were in my case and you were like, no, I'm going to carry well, if you miscarry, that miscarriage care gets tied up in these laws as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's really negatively impacting healthcare and it's causing it's causing doctors to leave. We have 147 counties in Texas without an OB. That's the population of Phoenix doesn't have an OB basically. And it's going to get worse. So I think for Texans it's realizing that we need to stop putting laws that interfere with healthcare. There are unintended consequences that kill people. And across the country as well, I think that everyone is realizing more that we need national action. Uh, you know, in Texas, we're extremely gerrymandered. So even if everybody gets out to vote, it's still tough. I mean, I'm I'm begging folks, you know, please save us. It's We need action from outside. We need help from outside too. So if everybody can, you know, look if you're registered to vote, you can go to vote.org. And then on the reproductive rights front, get involved with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Donate, volunteer. Uh, you know, if you've been impacted and want to join the case, they have an intake form as well um, at reprorights.org or their social handles are the same. Lauren, thank you so much. We're going to make sure that all of this information is in our show notes so that people can just click a link if they're like driving and they're like, oh, I didn't have time to write that down. It's super important that people do all of those things, get involved and join the case if they've been impacted. Thank you again so much for sharing your story. It's really, really hard to hear, but so important for us to hear. And I just appreciate you sharing something so private and so personal with us. Thank you so much. And it's always 
tough to go through this, but I just hope that for others, they feel like they're not alone if they're still scared to talk about their abortion with people they know. And also, you know, maybe this is something to get them talking and so everybody realizes we're here. This is happening to us. Thank you again. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, y'all. Oh my God, Dukes. Those are such incredible wow. guests. I like really enjoyed talking to both of them and hearing about what they had to say. I'm so honored that I got to host the podcast when we had such personally connected and informative guests and also just like wonderful to listen to. It's so wonderful to listen to. Also, both of them are so kind and funny, like affected, but like very present. It was just a joy. It was a treat. It really was. And they brought so much insight. And as always, these stories and everything you heard about in the interviews will be in the show notes. And we can't get this work done without the help of our terrible, horrible, no good fake sponsors. Moji, who is our benefactor this week? This episode of Feminist Buzzkills is sponsored by VagFax. Fellas, is it harder than ever to find new, unused women in this world of sluts and sin? No, we have to settle for a vag that's been around the block. You need a service that dives in and tells you exactly how much mileage that muffin has gotten. Luckily, there's VagFax. VagFax is the only site that researches used cooch and posts the reports online. Now you can browse vaginas from around the country and learn their entire history. How many previous owners? Unreported damage? Extreme wear and tear? Has she made any modifications? And most importantly, had any abortions? Gone are the days of having to get to know a vagina by taking it out for a test drive. VagFax lets you shop online by type or price, and our comprehensive VagFax reports give you the confidence you need as to just how much maintenance that vag will require. Simply scan your target's tramp stamp for a full diagnostic, or type in your desired make, model, and year into our patented Snatch Match search bar. Check out VagFacts.com today and get your thigh gap insurance quote included with coupon code NEWVAGSMELL. VagFacts, select your trad wife with confidence. That was something else. That was gross. (laughs) I feel like I have to take 12 showers after reading that commercial. Who is approving these sponsors? Not me. Quality control somewhere to keep us from having to read that drivel. What the fuck? Oh, man. Well, let's keep this hilarity going, shall we? Our next guest is New York-based comedian and host of the Betches Network podcast, Ask Men Anything. You've seen her on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and the CW's crazy ex-girlfriend. How does she do it all? We'll let her tell you. I've been having a hard time recently because I can't get my Adderall pills. There's a shortage of Adderall. It's been going on since October 2022. There's a backup at the factory. And that blows my mind because it's the Adderall factory. I just can't process it. Like, I could understand if it was the Xanax factory, (laughs) but the Adderall factory, I feel like the only issue should be overproduction. (laughs) Just a bunch of geeked out employees running around in the front yard like, I just can't stop making this shit, I don't know! Please welcome Emma Willman. Hi! Hi, Emma, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, how you guys doing? We're so great. It's so great to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Did you guys have any resolutions? Oh, uh, I try not to. I feel yeah, like I don't I, do that either. That sets up a, a really high bar for myself to continue to improve. I know that you love doing that sort of thing. That's <laughs> <laughs> I try not to do it anymore. This year I did. Uh, I'm trying to cut back on caffeine, but it's pretty ambiguous. So it's not like I failed or I did good or whatever. So just a little less caffeine. It's like the broad cutback. Yeah. It's not like a setting a bar. It's just a sidebar. Side so, note. Yeah. yeah. Side note, less caffeine this year for the love of God. <laughs> so <laughs> besides caffeine, Emma, what are you leaving behind in 2023 and what are you taking with you into 2024? Okay. This is what I'm definitely taking with me. I started doing therapy again in 2023. And this is the first time I like got into therapy where I wasn't, basically it was like a time where I wasn't feeling like I was in Maybe I'm not using the word crisis. That seems a little dramatic, but I was not in like any type of a crisis or super depressed or anything. It was much a much more calm where like I need different life skills to navigate some things, which then allowed me to like seek out therapy. Like I felt like I was actually interviewing therapists this time, whereas in the past when I've seen a therapist, I would just be like, you know, ask around and go with the first person that took my insurance or anything. Like there was no no vetting. No vetting. Yeah. Exactly. So this is the first time I was like asking about, you know, approach and 
that has made a big difference. So I'm definitely taking Barbara, my therapist, with me into 2024. That's great. We love Barbara. <laughs> we love Barbara. Well, Emma, you and I have known each other for many, many years. And yes. it's so nice to see you through the computer. We met, I think, the first time at a great little spot called Letage here in Philly. Where was that? Because I remember, remember it was kind of murky. It, it, that's the vibe of Letage. I love murky stories. Tell me more about this murky. <laughs> I remember, was it like, was there poetry involved? Am I psych? Am I nuts? No, I think it was like poetry? storytelling and poetry. And then yes. you were headlining that. Huh. <laughs> and you you were like, here we go. <laughs> you did great. Life. You fucking crushed it. And then, <laughs> and then we did it at a real comedy club, which was which was much more enjoyable. Where was the real comedy club? Uh, we were at Punchline Philly, right? When it opened. Wow. That was so fun. Is that a famous uh, club in Philly? It's they have chains all over. Now we've got oh, one in, nice. in Philadelphia as well. Started out in San Francisco. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. been it's been a long time since I've seen you in person. So it's so nice to see you here. Great to see you. One thing I love about you, Emma, of the many, many things, is that I feel like a lot of comics, especially since they learn the word pronoun, are mm. trying and failing to do what you do really well, which is like explore gender through comedy. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It's so impressive. I, I teach a lot of your jokes in my stand-up classes for that reason. I'm actually. so honored. Thank you. I've taken their stand-up class. I used to take, I took stand-up <laughs> class when I first started out and then I took over the pandemic, I did a bunch of like writing workshops, it helps with organization. And like, I feel like at least for me, I can never hear that stuff enough because I just, I find it interesting. So I like like comedy writing books. Like I just, I like that stuff. Yeah. You have such a good handle on like how to distill an idea. So I, we got to nerd out about jokes about at some point. I was Googling like what, how to do an opening joke. Like I remember just being like really frustrated. This is not long ago. This is maybe like two years ago. Like I was just like, man, like I, I got to get a different opening joke. I don't have something. And I was Googling like examples of a good opening joke, opening jokes to work with or opening joke prompts. And then I was reading this blog and they had an old opening joke that I did in the prompt. And nice. I, was, I was Googling, but I, and I was like, help, I need help. How do you do one of these things? And they were like, well, this person knows how to do it. And I was like, no, they don't. Now, a couple years later, they're Googling to try to figure out how to do it. But I, I appreciate that. That is extremely validating. It was. That's a really good way to look at it. The way I looked at it was <laughs> like, oh no, I'll never be able to do it again. But yes, that it was a nice way. That was, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, in the past, you would have had to go into a mountain and speak to God to get that sort of revelation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes to show, too, like, it's just a process for everybody each time you're starting from, like, you can, like, learn about how to construct something, but it's still, like, coming from the beginning when you try to, like, make something new, I find. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think is great about your comedy is, like, not only are you good at writing about gender, but you're super honest about it. Thank you. But you're also super successful as a result of it with TV roles and television stand-up sets. Like, how does it make you feel to be at your level because of how you talk about sexuality and gender? Things that people often are like too scared to do because we're told it'll keep us out. I get scared of it. Like, I remember when more people started talking about like pronouns openly, which is such a like great thing to have as progress in the conversation. Like, I think of gender as very much like a socialized reality, a reality that is like, so like, you know, race, class, gender, like socialized realities in flux and in, in context. I was so scared with the pronouns because I'm so open to talking about sex in relation to my sex life or gender in relation to my understanding of it, which is like very much through like my lived experience. Also like having the privilege of getting to study it at like a liberal arts college in Boston. I didn't study gender specifically, but I did take some classes on it. So I try to be like really aware of that lens that I'm able to like at least attempt to view things through but then with the pronouns it's like there would be times where I like for years even before it was a bigger part of the conversation I love playing around with like gender sexually so like I'd always want to have go back and forth with like doing role plays where like I'm a guy doing different things or like male pronouns in the bedroom but mm -hmm. it wasn't ever something I necessarily craves like getting called male pronouns to me didn't wasn't necessarily registering for me yeah I just didn't even think about pronouns for myself but then all of a sudden when people were, they'd be like, what are your pronouns? And I'd be like, Wah! and I'd feel so, I was like, well, shit. Because I was like, I, and I would be uncomfortable with it. So it actually, like, there's this comic in New York, Mike Yard. And it was like a couple months ago, he was introduced to me and he goes, oh, wait, real quick, what are your pronouns? And I was like, oh. and he was like, I'm asking everybody this, Emma. I'm not trying to give you a breakdown. And I was like, oh, right. Uh, she, her, or he, what I was like, she, her, whatever. I, you know, I just want to keep the conversation moving. So there's, for some reason, that one specifically has been a real snag because it's not something that I, I don't know. I've always, I, I just think of it as like a talking point, but 
Yeah. My girlfriend who's like very comfortably like, I'm a cis female. She's like, I don't have that same. I'm not like, oh, it's a talking point. She's like, I identify with it more. And I was like, I, I feel very comfortable speaking about sex and gender. Then I see so many people that don't really talk about sex or gender that much, but they're very comfortable being like pronouns. Boom. And I, ad- yeah. I admire that too. But it, I love talking about sex because I just think it's like such a culmination of so many different interesting intersections of the human condition. Yeah. I've never been, a, I haven't found a way to write about this. But I thought it was so interesting. Do you guys listen to Dan Savage at all? I do sometimes. I used to read his column a lot. Oh, nice. This Actually, this break, I listened to it a fair amount. Like this uh, December, I think I listened to like two two episodes. I just started listening to him only recently because my girlfriend will, was listens to him a lot. And I like, I'm like, I love this guy. On one of the episodes, he was talking about a study that had to do with like what people searched for in different regions, like the popular porn searches, you know, because people usually search for things that they think are taboo. Like that's like mm-hmm. kind of like, whoa, what's like something a little like that we shouldn't be going there. And that's the, so in the East Coast, the more popular porn, porn searches were around um, like daddy daughter play or like stepmom and stepson or like trigger warning, like incest in the sense of porn where it's understood that it's not real incest, but incestual yeah. thing. That's like the most taboo thing, East Coast. And that's like a very popular porn search. And then in the South, it was like gay. Like that's like straight up like gay or <laughs> They're like you said we can't say it. We're going to fucking Google it bitch. And that's <laughs> for in porn gay or like yeah, um, like interracial gangbang. Like because to them that is like, wow, how wild. And I just think that's it's so interesting. That ties into like what you were saying, even talking about like your issues approaching porn on yourself. Like we all. I think sex is such a spectrum, right? And I think I really like the way you put it when you were like, these are social, what did you say? You said something like social. Uh, socialized realities, but they're like socialized, but I don't, you don't want to like gaslight that it's a reality, but it's like. But it's socialized. No, I, and I fully agree. I, and I think that in that, in that spectrum, we all approach these things differently, right? So like, right. depending on where you are is where you have like a little bit more fluency, a little bit more comfort, a little bit more ease. Mm-hmm. Right. I want to talk about taboo for one minute. We've noticed that you've made this brave decision to ask men things. Oh, 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 when I when I saw the title of your podcast, I was like, um, my whole algorithm is like, let's take mics away from men. And then I was like, oh, and I was like, no, it's totally time to give men things to talk to. So why do you feel the need to talk to men? I need to hear more about this. So I was talking about it yesterday with someone. She was like, hey, will you like do a review of my podcast? And I was like, hell yeah, we do a review of mine. And so I said my the name of mine. And then she said the name of hers. And this person was like, what was the name of yours, Emma? And I was like, it's called Ask Men Anything. And she went, and why would anyone want to do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Fair. <laughs> so the the impetus for it was I have a lot of guy friends and masculine leaning friends where sometimes I would notice we would be having these conversations that I thought were like exploring masculinity in a different entry point. But also I was thinking that maybe people that... I relate to being like on the more feminine end of the spectrum or would not necessarily want to be there to hear, but would be curious about where it's like, what's a question? Like, I've got a question I'd like to ask a guy, but I don't want to have to deal with their response necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give a space to do that and to talk about like, I'm just curious, like how modern masculinity, what it is and how it affects them. And like, what's a space? It was a little bit like tongue in cheek too, like, because I did not want it to seem like, at like what I'm, how do we tell people how it should be with this? Like, it's not that yeah. at all. It's really no. just like asking them about, you know, like when did you first think of gender as a concept, which a lot of times they'll be like, you know, because if you're in like the dominant group or something, you're like, maybe they could be like, never, I didn't, what? what? Like, I never thought about it, but that actually hasn't been the case. Like there's been like a whole gamut of different responses about it. But the idea is just like asking men about masculinity and how it's affected their life but it's done on betches media which is female owned and operated we love them that also makes it a very comfortable thing because the power is all in the hands of like women ultimately yeah basically you're doing the work so that we don't have to asking some questions yeah (laughs) how do you choose your men i'll tell you exactly how so we've got a great booker and she'll pull some people but then a lot of it will be like guys that i know from the comedy scene in new york like the most recent um guest that we had was a friend of mine that is also a trainer but i am like looking to pull anybody that you think would be a good guest i would love to talk to them yeah we don't know any men you're still looking for a few good men that's what you're saying (laughs) you're still looking for a few good men yeah yeah men men yes men (laughs) 
You can ask me anything to ask them. Okay, see, that's the offer I was waiting for. Yeah. Back to doing the work so we don't have to. We can ask you to ask them in, and then we can just listen to your podcast and not have to. Yes. And we had a segment for a while that we'll still do sometimes called Apology Surrogate, where it's like, (laughs) we can't get the man who upsets you to apologize, but we can get a man to apologize. (laughs) And that's been fun to do. That's been really interesting to do because pretty much everyone's like got the assignment and and apologized. But then we had a couple of times where someone was like, well, I don't know if they should have like did. I don't know if they did something wrong. And then we'll be like, and then the producer's kind of like, wait, what? And then, but we were like, (laughs) okay, let's explore that. Like, why are you Mm -hmm. defending this guy and this? But usually they'll give like a very good apology for whatever wrong happened so men are getting better at apologies watch out everybody oh my god jared freed was great at apologizing he was like oh i bet because he was like i hear you i hear you is big Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i hear you and then showing that you really do hear the person oscar aiden incredible apology it's very much like empathy is key for the apology well emma um you've got a tour coming up sure do also, you were talking with Mateo Lane on your podcast about your tour rituals. And what I want to know, is there anything you do on tour that you would not do in real life? Wait, what did I say my rituals were at the time? You were like, I'm chaotic. I would love to have a ritual. but I can't. Oh, that's so interesting. That's so funny. So because ne- I was going to just say now I do have some rituals. But in the past, walk into the hotel room and be like, damn it. And then just like <laughs> chaos ensues. And, I, you know. Right before I would leave, I'd like clean everything up and like, but it would be just while I was in there, left to my own devices, pandemonium. I'm eating on one bed to then sleep on the other bed, but really I'm eating on both beds and like, just, it's just disgusting. Like it's just, there's no uh, up all night watching action movies and then waking up like, oh, why do I feel like crap? Like watching more porn than I even want to. Like I'm watching, I don't even feel like it, but I'm like, you got to pick it up and not like more porn, more, more food, more. You're here in a hotel. What else do you do in a hotel? <laughs> Typing out every head. search word from that map. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Mateo had, like, he'd be like, well, I wake up and I open the blinds. And I was like, what? And this is me, like, not drinking, too. Like, so that was just, like, what I used to do. So now I try to, like, it's so odd. I don't know if you guys have experienced this with, like, the older I've gotten now. I'm like, these little things do make such a big difference where it's like, unpack your bag. Get some water, set your alarm, do the, Mm -hmm. put out, see if you have a toothbrush, but that's taken me so long to now get these basic self-care things in place. Check in with a friend, get some steps. So that I pray will be my routine while I'm on the road now. Also, what I, I like to do now too is like I'll like write out a set list and I mm-hmm. I will take the TV remote and I'll walk around and kind of act it out. Like do a karaoke of Oh, I love comedy karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> Solo. That's awesome. Okay. I took notes. I will be implementing everything. I'm I'm in the chaos mindset. So I'm trying to Do you have ADD too? Yes. Yeah. I actually I took my Adderall today and I thought of you knowing that we were going to be doing this today. So it was very exciting. Um, Emma, thank you so much for, thank you for having me, inspiring us with your tales of the road, your tales of gender. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything coming up that you want to plug for the people? Yes. All my tour dates are on I am Emma Wilman.com. And then my social handles are just at Emma Wilman. And I'll be in California doing a bunch of West Coast states in February. But all my dates are up at I am And I'm I'm really proud of the stories and stuff that I'm sharing on the hour. So come on out. We'll have a good time. We'll love to say hi. We'll make sure that these are all in the show notes. Emma, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Oh my God, Dukes. That's our show. That's our show. Oh my gosh. Thanks again to Emma Wilman, Pamela Merritt, and Lauren Miller for bringing the awesome. And also you, thanks so much for listening. Like, subscribe. And show us some love with a five-star rating and stay connected on social media at Abortion Front. With your help, we can get more people to learn about this assault on abortion access. Looking for where you might fit in to do some abortion activism? We've got a five-part activist training series called Operation Save Abortion at OperationSaveAbortion.com. And visit our super cool activist calendar, which is full of local and national actions, as well as educational opportunities. Thursday, January 18th at 5.30 p.m. Central, Gender Justice is hosting a virtual trans equity training. Open to all genders and allies, participants will learn how best to talk about issues affecting people who are transgender, find ways to take action to combat the rising tide of violence against trans people, and meet others who are passionate about the fight for trans equity and empowerment. 
Link can be found in our activist calendar. Next week, we'll have special March for Life Madness coverage, and we'll be talking to Grace Howard, author of the forthcoming book, The Pregnancy Police, Conceiving Crime, Arresting Personhood. She's an expert on reproductive law and policy, and you don't want to miss it. And join our Patreon. You'll support great content and get cool Feminist Buzzkills merch and experiences. All pledges support this pod and all of our activism at Abortion Access Front. Pledge at patreon.com slash feminist buzzkills. Feminist Buzzkills is edited by Remy D. Tournay and is produced by Abortion Access Front. Finally, we leave you with live action's Lila Rose, a woman who shows us her whole transphobic anti-abortion ass in a 30 second clip. Activists who are calling it a human rights abuse to call a man a man. The human rights abuse in America today is the fact that we kill 2,500 babies in the womb every single day. It's not that we are treating people with mental health problems and accidentally calling them the wrong pronoun, as they say, when really it's a problem to elevate a mental health problem as the identity of a person. I think we need a heavy dose of reality here in the U.S. and in Canada. And throughout the West, it's a problem creeping throughout the Western world. We don't call babies babies in the womb anymore. We don't call men men anymore, women women. We need to go back to reality and that starts with biological facts feminist buzzkills the podcast from abortion access front new episodes drop friday when bs is popping we pop off and if you want to support our podcast and all the work of abortion access front like subscribe and join our patreon at patreon.com feminist buzzkills